Hey guys, Miss Marisa here, and in this video we're going to talk about photoelectron spectroscopy, uh, more shorthand known as PES. Uh, PES is a process that we can use to determine what is called the binding energy of electrons. Uh, it's how much energy all the electrons are kind of held into the electron cloud, into the atom itself. And from that information, we can actually start to figure out what the electronic structure would look like, like what the electron clouds and the different sublevels are. Um, if you've ever wondered how we know that there's two electrons in the 1s sublevel, two electrons in the 2s sublevel, six electrons in the 2p sublevel, if you've ever wondered how do we get those numbers, uh, the answer actually comes from evaluating PES graphs. Uh, the process of PES utilizes what is called the photoelectric effect, um, which is when we shoot high energy light uh, at a surface, what that will do is it will cause the electrons to eject off. Um, this actually ties to ionization energy that we talked about when we did periodic trends. Ionization energy is actually pulling off electrons in a particular order. We've so far have talked about the first ionization energy, which is the removal of the first electron by this process, um, but there's also a second and a third and a fourth successive ionization energy, which is pulling off those electrons in order. Uh, this particular process doesn't take into account that order. It's just how much energy does it take to remove any electron at any time. So if you ever look at this binding energy data versus, say, the successive ionization energies, the values will be a little bit different just as a warning on that. Um, so the machine itself is that we use for this process is huge. It like basically takes up a whole entire room. And what you do is you put your sample into the machine and the machine will shoot its high energy waves at that sample. Um, so here, here's our photon source. And again, most of the time we use x-rays because those have a little bit higher energy um, because uh, we want information about all the electrons. Uh, if we only use UV, we sometimes don't get information about all the electrons that we want. Sometimes that only works on the valence ones. So when we shoot that energy, what that'll cause is are the electrons to be ejected. And the deal is, is that we shoot a particular amount of energy into it. And depending on how much energy it takes to remove those electrons to get them to eject, the electrons will then possess a particular amount of energy afterwards. So by kind of comparing the difference between what did we originally shoot into it and what does the electron have after it, it gets ejected, by comparing those differences, we can figure out how much energy it took to remove that electron. So what happens is the detector will measure all the electrons coming through and how much energy they have, and then translate that back into what is called the binding energy. And from that information, we'll end up creating graphs that have particular peaks on them. Each of the peaks will be at a particular energy, and the peak height will be representative of approximately the ratio of electrons that had that particular amount of energy. Okay, so a lot going on here with this, but the key kind of thing we want to get out of this is that from all that information, we can actually start to construct what the electron cloud looks like. Now, there's one question down here at the bottom of this. It says, hey, thinking about columbic attractive forces, which we talked about when we did periodic trends, it says, would you expect a 1s or a 2s electron to have a, both a greater ionization energy, but also a higher binding energy, kind of both. Because again, they're related even though they're not quite the same. Both of them are referencing how much energy does it take to remove. Well, if we think back to Coulomb's law, remember Coulomb's law says that force equals charge over distance. So the big difference between 1s and 2s would be that distance component of it. Obviously, the 1s electrons are a lot closer to the nucleus, so their distance would be a lot smaller. So because 1s have a decreased distance from the nucleus, then we can expect them to have higher attractive forces. And if they have higher attractive forces, it's going to take more energy to remove them. So therefore, they would have a higher binding energy.
All right, so with that said, let's actually look at some samples of these graphs so we can kind of start to evaluate the information presented on them. So looking at the next page here, I've kind of put a lot of information on this page, but the key part of it that I want to look at first is this lovely graph right here. Uh, you notice a couple things about it. First off, this one is pretty well labeled, but as you can see at these ones on the bottom, most of the time they don't come with those lovely labels, okay? Um, we notice that we have binding energy down here. Sometimes it'll just say energy. This particular graph actually kind of counts backwards. You notice it counts from 100 to 1. We have to be really careful on our graphs which way they count. I have seen questions where they could count either way. So we'll see an example here in just a minute where it's the same graph just printed different ways. So we need to always look at that. And then we notice we have a relative number of electrons here. So this particular graph had three peaks, which is representative of three different sublevels, three different groups of electrons that had a different binding energy to them. Also, I noticed that this end of the spectrum has a higher binding energy to it. So remember what we just said a minute ago, the 1s electrons being closer to the nucleus would always have a higher binding energy than the 2s or eventually 3s, 4s, whatever, anything further would have a lower binding energy. So what that means is whenever I find my higher energy end, I know that this end of the spectrum is always closer to the nucleus. If this, peak, if this particular peak has a higher energy to it, then what that means is that it must be closer to the nucleus distance-wise, okay? So now let's think about electron configurations, okay? We know we always start off with 1s2. So if this height is kind of representative of two electrons, I see my next peak is about the same height. So again, that would be another two electrons. However, I notice its binding energy is a little bit lower. Well, that's because as I work my way out, that distance increases, those attractive forces are less, and so therefore it's gonna be easier to remove those electrons. I won't need as much energy to rip that electron away. However, I notice my third peak here is much higher than the other two peaks were. In comparison, if these are representative of two, this one is representative of a five. It's about two and a half times taller than this other peak here. So this is representative of my 2p5 electrons. Ah, so now we're starting to see that electron configuration order, right? Something else I wanna point out. You notice there's a really big gap in energy here but only a small gap in energy between these. That big gap in energy comes because I'm moving a whole entire energy level further out. Here, both of these are in the same energy level, but because they're in slightly different shaped sublevels, they're gonna have a slightly different energy. But that bigger jump happens when we are jumping up occupied energy levels. Um, so. Once I, I can see it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, then I can just look up what element that would be on my periodic table and figure out that it was for fluorine. All right, so let's look at one other one. Actually, it's kind of a two for one down here, okay? It says here that we have two PES graphs and both of them are for the same element. Which element is shown in the graphs? Label the peaks with their correct sublevel. So you can see here, these look really similar, but the big difference is, is that on this first graph, Notice the high energy end of the graph is down over here. So that means this is closer to the nucleus. Where on this particular graph, that closer to the nucleus end is down over here because here's my energy of 10 versus 0.1. Obviously, that's really low. So again, these two ends of it are my closer to the nucleus end. So once I figure out that closer to the nucleus end, then I start thinking through my electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. I start thinking through that order and I start labeling my peaks. The first peak that's closest to the nucleus is always going to be your 1s. And assuming I have stuff after it, it's gotta be 1s2. Okay, we know that that would have to be full if we're dealing with something in the ground state. So then the next peak obviously would be the 2s peak. Okay, and from there I have to say, well, it's only half the height of the 1s peak, so this must only be 2s1. It's only representative of one electron versus two. And I see the same thing here, guys. Look, this is my 1s2. This peak is half the height. So this would be the 2s1. 
So it's the showing the same exact information, it's just showing it kind of in a flipped pattern. I will say this, typically these graphs go from high energy to low energy because that puts the peaks in filling order. However, you always want to be careful just in case they flipped it around on us. So once I figure out it's 1s2, 2s1, then I would just go look on my periodic table and see who that would be. So 1s2 would fill up hydrogen and helium, so 2s1 would end with lithium. So both of these graphs happen to be for the lithium ion, even though they are flipped graphs. All right. Uh, I will be making a second video where we'll be evaluating some of these PES graphs a little bit further, but hopefully this gives you a good foundation of what exactly PES is and what these PES graphs are trying to show us. Um, if you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye, guys.